the Brown Pundits Browncast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Brown Pundits Browncast. This is the 18th episode in our series of podcasts on the history of Indian subcontinent. In this episode, we'll talk about the Marathas. My name is Manish Taneja and joining me in this episode as speakers are Pathmesh Godbole, Amit Paranjpe, Dr. Omar Ali and Gaurav Lele. Welcome to the episode, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Right. Right. Uh, Prathamesh and Amit, since this is the first time you are coming on uh, Brown Pandit's Browncast History Podcast series as speakers, I would request you to introduce yourself. If you could just tell us about yourselves, what is it about history that interests you and some of the earliest, uh, some of the history books that sort of got you going in history. Prathamesh, we start with you. Sure. So I started reading history a while back, a few years ago, and most of it was the more popular books and I read Dr. Uday Kulkarni's book called Solstice at Panipat, which covered the Panipat campaign of the Marathas, which who fought the Afghans in at, at Panipat in 1761. And that led me to studying more and more. And I found that there were a lot of gaps in terms of we don't know enough, even though it's a fairly recent time, so especially when you compare it with European history. So I dug into primary sources and we, I found there's actually a lot more material there than that has actually made its way to books. So I think that's really been an area of interest for me. I ended up studying it for about two years now. And so I think that that's, a, that, that's the primary interest I have, that military history and how India evolved differently versus Europe. Right. So AP. do you read uh, Modi, Prathamish? I don't actually, but a lot of the material has already been converted to Devanagari and published, say, in multiple volumes like the Peshwe Daftar Archives or uh, Mr. Rajwade, another great historian. He has some 20 volumes and there is Etihasik Lake Sangha and so on. Okay. Right. Amit, if we could request you to introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Amit Paranspe. I'm uh, <clears throat> just a history enthusiast. I've been in the tech uh, software sector for many years. And uh, I have been interested in history since uh, since my school days. But um, it was mostly, uh, you know, high-level books, starting with Amar Chitra Katha during school days, graduating to some history books, some biographies, some historical fiction, which later on I didn't like. And uh, uh, same as... Uh, Prathamesh mentioned uh, about 10, 12 years back uh, uh, after moving back to India. So I was in the U.S. for many years uh, prior to that in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, got introduced to Dr. Uday Kulkarni and uh, since then have read all of his books. And uh, I've become a big fan of Maratha history, specifically 18th century uh, Maratha history uh, for two main reasons. Uh, one uh, reason, I mean, obviously it's very close to home to, uh, to Pune where I live which was uh, the nerve center for a lot of a uh, lot of this 18th century history uh, secondly i thought that uh, uh, historians um, uh, earlier the british and later unfortunately even uh, uh, some of the indian historians after independence haven't done any justice to the 18th century history the the traditional uh, or the popular view that has been um, uh, propagated is uh, we had the Mughals in the 17th century and we had the British in the 19th century and the Maratha history is just relegated to one small para or somewhere and that too focused on losses and defeats like uh, like Panipat. Uh, so the fact that 18th century history was revolving around Marathas and they were the de facto power uh, and the empire from, from which uh, the English effectively uh, captured India is not known very well even in Maharashtra, let alone outside. Uh, so Dr. Kulkarni's books have done a, a great job uh, and uh, on social media, I have uh, discussed those books, uh, have reviewed them, have interviewed Dr. Kulkarni a few times. In addition to that, I have read some of the, uh, I mean, I haven't done as much research as uh, Pratamesh. He has done a great job in looking at some of these old documents and uh, records that are available. Uh, I have read some uh, partial works of uh, Sardesai, who is considered one of the uh, best uh, historians who's compiled a eight-volume Maratha history uh, book or uh, collection. 
and uh, and few others uh, as well. I, I prefer biographies and uh, and uh, non-fiction books. Uh, so I think, and I guess this discussion is focused on uh, non-fiction history. So we'll not get into the fiction part of it. Uh, so yeah, so mostly mostly just an interest, though not an expert by by any stretch. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so we'll get started on uh, Maratha history. Prathamesh, uh, when we talk of Marathas, what are the sources that we refer to in tracing their origins and their history? So if to define Marathas as a, not specifically the caste today, but in as a people, then the linguistic identity was strong enough that the Shevuna Yadava kingdom in the 1300s adopted it as a language of the court. And this this was, I think earlier it was Kannada and now this was a marked change, which you can say in a way it was like the first Maratha state. And we don't unfortunately have a lot of sources for, for that era, but there were a lot of old noble families who have their own, what you call Bakars or chronicles. So these are some of these are contemporary and others are written much later. So they are not written professionally in the sense that you would expect of a modern historian, but they do contain a lot of useful information. So for example, there is a, a Bakar of Panipat, which was written a few months after. Now we cannot tell if every conversation mentioned in it did actually take place, but it's very useful as a rough guideline for how things played out. And it's, it actually gives you a lot of insight into things like what kind of armor did they wear or what, how did they take positions? How did they, how were messengers dispatched from, you know, the commander who is, who may be further behind in the camp and where the fighting may be happening some distance away. Then from Shivaji Raja, we actually have a formal history. It's called Shiv Bharat. It's in Sanskrit, but it has been translated to Marathi and English. And you also have a lot of historians from the Mughals who have written of their interactions with Marathas. So I think from Shivaji Raja, you, you get formal histories written by the court for both Shivaji Raja and Shambhaji Raja, as well as their successor, Chitrapati Raja Ram and Chitrapati Shahu. And for the later times, which is say 1730s, I would say mostly, although you do have material from 1720s, most of your material is available in the form of uh, what do you call state archives. So you, you have a big published set of volumes called a Peshwa Daftar. And there is another called uh, Mr. Rajwade's uh, Itihasik Sahitya, I think. It's another 20 volumes. So you have all these letters that were in the state archives of the Marathas. And, and, and so all of these have been translated from the original Modi script to Devanagari. And they are all published. I think they are, even the books are out of copyright because they were published 100 years ago. So they are kind of easy to find online. From the mid 1700s or even I would say late 1600s, you have Europeans who visited extensively. So European records is yet another kind of source of history. Right. So what do these records tell us? Who were the early Marathas? And how did they end up uh, in the present day state of Maharashtra? So if you, I mean, if, if you really go very far back, then you did have uh, both uh, all kinds of dynasties in present day Maharashtra since the Mauryan times. The Mauryans actually had a very important port just north of Mumbai called Sopara, which is, I think, the present day uh, locality of Nala Sopara. And this was a vital port for trade with Greece and with Rome. So what you define as Maharashtra today was fairly always like integrated, you know, domain of other empires. Uh, I think if you strictly define it as the, the language, like identify it with the language, which is Marathi, then I would say you would only count from the medieval, which is the Shevna Yadavas. And Around the time, like although the state collapsed after invasion by Alauddin Khilji in 1290 and then multiple raids by the Tughlaqs later, although the state was gone, the noble families didn't disperse. And so they continued to you know, remain as a very strong force. I, I mean, I would say they've always been there. They, they didn't really come and settle down in the medieval era or something. 
and i think they the kind of passed a critical threshold by the 1600s when they got influential enough that they were almost like small states by themselves they would command armies of 5 or 10000 or more they would have their own administration and you know men who were loyal to them so they could make or break kingdoms at times so i think that's really the point where they got too big to ignore and so they started getting more prominence you see paintings of maratha sardars like lakuji jadhav rao and others who you know played key roles in either opposing the mughals or helping them so i think they it, it's kind of a misnomer to say that they emerged in the 1600s or though it's just like they got past a critical point of being important so they kind of got noticed at that point right uh do ramesh i i this is omar i, I just have a question at this uh, point there was uh, i was just chatting with mr amin one day and he said uh, something that sort of stuck in my mind that in his view the marathas are the pakhtuns of india and i i have no special knowledge of maratha history at all I don't know if this is at all true, but is there anything like that that you could say? Uh, I am not so familiar with uh, Pakhtun history to uh, kind of make uh, an equivalent comparison. But in a broad stroke, like you could say, there are similarities in the sense that they emerged from a small area and went on to to you know be the pioneers of founding a large state. and much of it was driven from a fairly small pool like you had the the suri dynasty that pushed the moguls out during humayun's time or the durranis and so on so yes i think there is you could say there are some similarities in the sense that it it is a small you know set of original set of people was small and they ended up conquering large areas but i think that's pretty much where it ends because uh i would say that the marathas were not really uh, like this wasn't technically even the first state if you count the yadavas and they have had a far more impact i would say true i think omar i think i, I think you are referring to uh, yadunath sarkar's reference right i i have not read that uh, so no i think I yadunath know. sarkar he, does he does make yadunath yadunath sarkar does comment. make this brief reference but i think that was more tactical if i if i understand it right uh, from whatever uh, i have read uh, he draws a parallel more on uh, the fact that they come from uh, and he specifically talking about uh, marathas uh, during the uh, chatrapati shivaji maharaj era about the 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 mawlis coming from the mawal and talk about how uh, agriculture was not as uh, as prosperous as obviously the gangetic plains uh they were they were they were uh they were tough people they were hearty people uh you know they had to move around uh, often and they were not you know as uh, uh settled prosperous like uh, i mean it was not very easy subsist, uh, subsistence like uh, you had in uh, in uh, northern india at that time so so from uh, from that standpoint i think he drew those parallels about the the topography the country and the hardships and Uh, and uh, the parallel i think eventually he draws is that also made them more battle ready in some sense that was sort of a weak parallel that he was drawing in at least one section that i have read right that's an interesting take uh, uh prathamesh what do we know about the early religious affiliation of marathas uh what kind of hinduism they practiced do we know anything about that i don't think it was any different from any of the neighboring regions say in karnataka or gujarat or so on i mean it's not i think an area that has been studied much and i think we we know a bit more from shivaji rajesh time or later and it, i mean it's I, i don't know if we can really distinguish it in any way with you know the way it is practiced today sure sure so oh, what do we know about shivaji maharaj and sisters uh what was maratha polity like when he came to power or when he was being groomed for kingship so this is a very interesting question because typically you know the focus is on north india where you had the large empire remade by akbar and in the south it is the deccan sultanates but i you know what people forget is that vijayanagar was still around 
and conventionally people say that even vijayanagar went into decline after the battle of talikota in 1565 but it was very temporary and although their border shifted down they were still around as a force almost till the 1620s and it's only after the second civil war in 1614 followed by disintegration that it really fell apart in the 1640s so in a sense it was it's a very close link between what used to be former vijayanagar lands and shahji raje who was shivaji raje's father so shiva shahji raje was a former sardar in the nizam shahi of ahmednagar and uh, you know he tried to kind of save the dynasty not maybe for the sake of the dynasty but because he would be its king maker against the moguls and although that didn't work he became very prominent because its his military skill was well recognized and as a condition to keep the region stable the moguls made a deal with bijapur where shahji raje was sent to the south and incidentally this happened to be all the lands of former vijayanagar and he ended up stabilizing these regions and that where is core jagirs in bangalore for instance and i would not be surprised if there were administrators or you know former vijayanagar ministers also who would have been sent to pune which was his home jagir so i i think it definitely did play a role in shaping shivaji raj's outlook as a child growing up where his father kind of had a template or road map that although they did not have their own state there was a state that they may want to model it on just recently in the far, in the far south and the, the adil shah itself was fairly i would say a com- high complexity state they had extensive artillery they were very good in terms of military and after they were expanded they like i calculated that as a measure of state capacity if you measure by revenue then it was almost half of the moguls so i mean they are not a push over state it was a very strong state and it would have been it would definitely be a difficult but a worthwhile endeavor if somebody were to carve out a state in it so when shivaji raj emerged in the 16 i would say 40s and 50s all the ingredients for a state were kind of ready you had a large number of maratha sardars in the employ of these different sultans they commanded the loyalty of the troops they were veterans many of them had fought battles sieges and you also had people with administrative experience all that was needed was the right person to actually make this happen right so what do we know about the man himself uh if you could just take us sorry through I, the... i forgot right so so uh if you like the formal history says that uh, their ancestors came from the sisodia dynasty in rajasthan and this was sometime in the 1300s or so and uh, i think we, we what we do know is that up to for two or three generations prior they were senior nobles in service of the deccan sultans so that i mean that's the background pune was his uh, home jagir of shahji raje and that's where shivaji grew up although he was personally not supposed to be there to because it would cause disturbances between the sultanates if he attempted to revive the nizam shahi of ahmednagar again so he grew up largely uh, in the care of his mother but he had good advisors like daraji konde and i think they would have played a role in shaping his world view and probably you know where how, how he came up with the ideal of swaraj right amit what have you read about uh, shivaji maharaj's early days and uh, his formative years and what have you heard from growing up in pune about the man yeah so chatrapati shivaji maharaj uh, occupies uh, probably the most important uh, position in in uh, maharashtra uh, history especially if we look at the last uh, last 500 years as prathamesh mentioned he did uh, spend uh, some of his early years uh, in pune and those were uh, those were his uh, formative years uh, uh, as as you know he was born uh, at uh, uh, the shivnari fort which is also in the pune district and uh, uh, geographically also if you look at uh, 
uh, uh, the Pune region, it is it is blessed with uh, a large number of uh, uh, forts, as as you know, probably one of the highest concentrations uh, anywhere in India. And that's because of a unique uh, geographical topography where we have uh, uh, the Western Ghats uh, fairly near to the city, but then the city itself is uh, is in the plains area and where we also have the Sangam of Mula Mutha. So uh, here you had a city or a town that uh, was uh, uh, was well located, but had uh, was surrounded uh, on at least two or three sides by a series of forts. And that made it strategic. And that also, uh, I mean, amongst the many things, I think that influenced uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Raja. I think the geography and topography of this region and the presence of the Mawal area that I had uh, referred to some time back from where he was able to recruit a lot of his early uh, early uh, friends and uh, soldiers and and uh, sardars and leaders uh, also also played a part. So I think uh, that is one point uh, which is not often discussed that I will uh, I will uh, highlight. Of course, his mother played a very very important role in in mentoring him uh, and uh, setting up uh, all the the ideals the visions in in front of him, which which he took forward. And then, as you know, at a very young, uh, early age, uh, he was wasn't even sixteen. That's when he took uh, took his uh, uh, famous uh, shapat of uh, of uh, you know fighting for uh, for his. Uh, for his own uh, Swarajya, and uh, that that was also uh, nearby uh, near a uh, near Pune, a fort called Raireshwar. So, so this region was, and also one more point: the fort, first fort that he captured on his own with his uh, uh, team of uh, young uh, young Bawadas and and uh, leaders was Torna. That's also very close to Pune city in the in the Pune district. So this is where really uh, it all started uh, for him. Right. And uh, Prathmesh, Amit, uh, who, who, is, who is he fighting? Who is he, who is he fighting for these forts? Who are the rulers of this area? So in the early days, this was supposed to be the Adil Shah territory of Adil Shah of Bijapur. And states, as we know it, were fairly feudal all the time. So when you say you know, people draw borders on a map, it is kind of a little bit misleading for the time because forts would change hands all the time, either because the soldiers were in paid or the Kildazar got a better offer with a bribe from the rival sultan. This is especially true for the border ones, not the interior ones. And this was a highly kind of contested region in the sense that the Mughals were next door to the north and uh, the Adil Shai, this was the northernmost extent of the Adil Shai. So many of these forts would have been either like disputed territory between the two, not mentioned in the treaty or so. And I mean, it wouldn't be that, uh, you know, the kind of siege that you would expect them to do in the later days with a large number of artillery, you know, being fired at the fort and lots of muskets firing. This would be more in the form of where negotiations are more likely or you know, storming it with a small party is more likely to be more efficient than a full-scale attack. So in, in the early days, almost for the first 20 years or so, his primary enemy was the Adil Shai of Bijapur. But the Mughals did kind of make their way in from the 1660s when Aurangzeb consolidated his rule in 59, 1659. And I think the first expedition was led by Shai Stakan. Right. I mean, if I could, uh, if you could comment on why is it that uh, Shivaji Maharaj's rule is so strongly associated with Hinduism? Did he identify himself primarily as a vanguard of the Hindu revival? Or is it that he was somebody who believed uh, deeply in Hinduism and used it as a force multiplier for his political ambitions? I I think I think it's uh, it's the it's the former, uh, but uh, I think there was definitely uh, so what had happened uh, after after the Yadava Empire uh, uh, went away uh, in the 
uh, 13th, early 14th century, is uh, this whole region of Maharashtra was uh, was subjected to foreign rule uh, for the first time in its history. And uh, he, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Raja was the first one who uh, led the revival. And uh, clearly his focus was revival of... Uh, of the uh, local local culture, local religion, local customs, all of which were uh, were being affected, and and ultimately Swarajya, which is local rule. You didn't want uh, foreigners coming from outside and controlling. So I think it 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 it's 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 all of these. But I think he he definitely wanted uh, uh, to liberate uh, liberate this uh, from from liberate this area this land from from foreign control and uh, revive the original original customs ideas religions uh, temples uh, and uh, and the entire the entire entire culture in some sense i would say uh, pratamesh yeah that i agree with that uh, i'll just add like a little bit of comment so if you look back at the classical era of India, of say, or Hinduism, then the ideal model for a ruler is that he's also the defender of dharma. And a king, the, the point of having a king is that he prevents the onset of matsyanya, or a law where the big fish, it's the small fish. It's not meant to be a jungle law where you know, might is right and you do not have a rule of law. And so in that sense, the rule of the sultans, the Bahamanis or the Adil Shahis, not all of them were necessarily the same, but it would be seen as much in eye to the common man, where you have somebody who is not a local, who is a foreigner, he's ruling here, and he's determining that, you know, maybe you can't celebrate this festival or you can't, you know, ride this horse, which is meant only for the nobles who are maybe from Persia or something. And you, you know you cannot build these forts. And essentially, you no longer have a rule of law because your law is not same as their law. And so, in that sense, the restoration of status quo after a gap of three hundred years is a big factor in you know, you know really is like Shivaji Raja being seen as a restorer or restorer of dharma. And I think it's worth adding here that. Uh, part of it is also because of contemporary politics, right? Uh, there is a issue, a live issue in the Indian subcontinent of whether there is such a thing as an Indian identity that includes Hindus, Muslims, everybody, or there is a separate corporate identity of Muslims and Hindus and everyone else. Uh, and this, people on various sides of this issue will then take positions on Shivaji in line with their current political problems, right? Their current political preferences, uh, which may or may not be entirely in line with what Shivaji was thinking. Right. Right. Uh, no, I agree. You know, it's kind of, I think, misleading to project current political ideas on a medieval era or early modern times, because people then did not see it the way we see it today. Sure. Uh, now, we could do an exclusive and a dedicated episode on Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, but this is not that episode. So, what we'll do is we'll cover some of the other aspects and we'll link uh, as part of episode notes books that our speakers think uh, listeners should read if they want to know more about his rule. But what I would like to do before we move on is talk about a personality of uh, his reign, which we just get a passing reference in our history books. His Admiral Kanoji Angre. And his naval fleet. Uh, Prathmesh, if you could talk to us about that. So the fleet actually began before uh, Kanoji. I think it started fairly early on in the 1660s. And this was, again, one of Shivaji Raj's really, you know, one of the big decisions that he made. And it was a very crucial one. Because he was on a... On a land that was very close to the coast. It had several important ports and he could see that the Portuguese, the English, I think the English were not as prominent when he started, but the Portuguese were very strong. And it was a major source of both power and revenue for the Europeans as well as the Sultans. So he began by using or rather hiring away Portuguese sailors, deserters, shipbuilders. And very soon they mastered it and started building their own ships. So one major difference is that the Marathas did not want to or even aim to 
try to be something like the Royal Navy or the Portuguese Navy, because the Portuguese Navy was designed to, you know, travel the seas like from Atlantic to the Pacific. While the Martas did not have any access to markets in Europe. So even if they had built a navy, they could not have really, like a blue water navy, they could not have really done much with it. So instead, what they did is they used their resources to focus on a very narrow objective, which is that they wanted to control their coast. So you didn't need large ships, like what you call the capital ships of the English Navy, for instance, the galleons. But instead, you built smaller ships that are more maneuverable in shallow waters. They're able to go up creeks and they are still able to direct fire on the coastal you know, fortifications and you know, seas and merchant ships that do not pay their tax. So to this, I think they did a, they were very successful at it. They were, uh, I think, commanded by Kanoji from 1670s or 80s. I'm not sure of the exact timeline, but they, they did a great job of it and they were able to impose their own taxes on even European and the Sultanate ships. And I think in, at some point they made a mutual agreement with the Europeans where neither would be harassing the other ships. And I think that that's an admirable position to achieve against states that had been, you know, doing this for centuries. Yes, and I'll add, uh, I think, uh, I fully agree with Prathamesh. It was, it was a defensive posture, uh, at least initially, to defend and Portuguese were the more prominent power and uh, Dutch as well. And the English were probably just, just uh, setting up at, uh, at that time. And, uh, uh, and it's very interesting. I mean, uh, Kanoji Angre obviously is one of the uh, key figures in the Maratha Navy. And uh, he was very influential and he did defend the, uh, the Maratha interests, the Indian interests uh, very effectively. Uh, but it's a very interesting perspective of how, uh, depending on who writes history, how your perspective completely changes. While clearly from our perspective, uh, Kanoji Angre and the Angres uh, later on were, were the uh, heroes uh, of, uh, of Indian history for the most part in terms of defending the coast. The, the British wrote, of, wrote about them as pirates. There's a reference of Angria pirate or some, some, some exact, I forgot the exact word. But uh, so it's, it's interesting to note how they uh, completely twisted it from, from their point of view. Right. Right. Uh, Prathamesh, uh, at the end of the 17th century, starting of 18th century, if we were to plot the uh, map of Maratha state on the present day map of India, uh, how would it look like? Which all states did it cover? Well, you say end of, sorry, did you say end of 18th century or 17th? End of 17th century. So we are, uh, uh, sorry, end of 18th, uh, end of 17th century, beginning of the 18th century. Okay. So this was like the, the perhaps the most difficult phase of their existence. And Aurangzeb was pretty much at the door. He, I think he, the Jinji. So when the war began in 1670s or 80s, when Aurangzeb, marched down south into the Deccan, they held most of what would be present-day Western Maharashtra uh, along the coast, as well as a line of forts stretching south and parts of Tamil Nadu centered around Jinji. Now, after the invasion and lots of destruction, 20 years of war, desolation, by the end of the century, I think they were left with maybe like a scattering of forts here and there. And it, it's actually very difficult to make a map because these forts were changing hands every two weeks. So there is a Mughal historian called Kafi Khan who wrote his memoirs. And unfortunately, the Maratha letters or information was lost after the forts fell or the sacking. But we do know from him that it was a very turbulent time and each fort would change hands sometimes multiple times in the course of a year. And what happened is the, the Mughal armies were extensive, enormous. I think you have visitors describing that the entire camp had something like almost half a million people. So if you have around maybe 400,000 or so total people in the camp, there must have been at least one lakh or one, almost two lakh soldiers. So this is a very slow moving camp, although it's you know impossible to defeat in a field. But the smarter thing to do is to simply avoid it. 
and every time they would march somewhere uh, take a fort after a heavy cost the the marathas would just vacate it and maybe when they move on they would come back and recapture it so you will often find references where the moguls will say that you know many times the fort would be surrendered without a fight because the garrison had not been paid or they simply didn't care and uh, attackers would threaten that we will cut you down to the last man if you don't ha- if you don't hand it over so why you know what are you fighting for it's been 25 years you've been you know fighting still and you've not made any progress you're going to would you die for a fort that would maybe change hands again in two months yeah. probably not so i i would say the bo- the boundaries are really difficult to define but you could say that it was a very contested region across western maharashtra this was this was probably the most difficult time and they were led by so in from 1701 to 1707 they were led by chatrapati rajaram's wife as the effective ruler she had crowned her minor son and she was the regent so aurangzeb expected this would be a very easy war to win with you know nobody really no military king but it ended up being the opposite right amit what do we know about marathas in the early 18th century so 1707 is when aurangzeb dies what is maratha polity like when he dies and uh, i think yes yeah, so 1707 uh, uh, aurangzeb after his uh, 26 27 year war effectively you can uh, argue that he lost the war and he uh, obviously the objective of conquering the deccan uh, complete deccan had failed and uh, he he died uh, in in uh, in maharashtra here and uh, after that uh, the the politics uh, in delhi and politics in maharashtra also uh, took a very very interesting turn since aurangzeb was 90 and there was no clear succession planning and the fact that there was uh, he was not in delhi for the last 25 27 years uh, there was a lot of turmoil uh, obviously in in delhi as to who uh, should succeed him and uh, that politics uh, uh, continued for for a while now uh, in in maharashtra so what happened was uh, chatrapati uh, shahu maharaj uh, the son of uh, chatrapati sambhaji raje was captive uh, uh, was cap- in uh, in uh, uh, aurangzeb's uh, control for the last uh, uh, you know nearly uh, 17 18 years uh, and uh, just in order to sort of uh, i mean there was a very fairly complicated internal politics amongst the moguls and one of that uh, led to uh, the release of uh, chatrapati shahu maharaj one camp said because that would sort of make their uh, status a little stronger and uh, chatrapati shahu maharaj uh, was released and uh, he he came back to satara and uh, from a maratha standpoint uh, so he he became the chatrapati and uh, that started uh, that started a, a stable reign uh, from satara for uh, for the marathas now uh, chatrapati chahu maharaj uh, fairly early on uh, was able to find a very uh, capable and uh, trusted uh, 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 minister a prime minister uh, uh, by the name of balaji vishwanath who uh, who is uh, bajirao's father and he was made the made the peshwa i think around 17 uh, uh, i forgot the exact year but 1711 or 1713 i think and uh, he uh, was able to make some uh, good uh, successful campaigns for chatrapati shahu maharaj one of the first and foremost one was when uh, th- there was a fight between uh, uh, the two factions uh, of the marathas as well because uh, uh, as as prathamesh had mentioned earlier it was uh, uh, tarabai maharani tarabai who was leading the marathas and one reason why the uh, moguls had left uh, has had released uh, chatrapati shahu was to create this conflict specifically between the two maratha factions so in that uh, conflict uh, balaji vishwanath was able to skillfully maneuver uh, various sides together and uh, strengthen uh, uh, chatrapati shahu uh, shahu maharaj uh, and he became sort of the the uh, the preeminent uh, the prime uh, leader of of the marathas uh, of of that period and then later on uh, as delhi politics got more and more interesting it's very uh, it's very interesting to know that just in the next 5 6 years 
the uh, one of the mogul factions in delhi actually asked uh, chatrapati shahu maharaj to send in a force to support their uh, their claim on the on the throne of delhi but i think we will we'll come back to that later because that was a very interesting uh, switch in uh, in the history of uh, not just maharashtra but history of india in a span of uh, just 12 years uh, after the death of aurangzeb uh, bajaji vishwanath uh, peshwa uh, his son bajirao were in uh, in delhi with a with an army of 20 or 30000 sure we will come to that and pramesh before i ask you to comment on that uh, on the early 18th century marathas could you tell us about uh, sambhaji uh, uh so i think he is a kind of uh, i mean i think he he gets less i would say attention partly because not all of the material has been studied much of it has even been lost because of the sack and plunder of forts and land that followed soon after his death but i think he his his decisions were crucial in in terms of not surrendering to the moguls and in a way they i think the aurangzeb kind of dug his own grave by torturing and executing sambhaji raje so he he came to the throne in 1681 and he waged a war for about the next 8 years and i think this is a very crucial time because the moguls at this time were at their peak and the marathas were still although they were strong they were not strong enough to face the moguls in a large scale war lasting for decades so their initial focus was defensive and i think in another case of events of the north affecting events in the south one of aurangzeb's son i think akbar had rebelled against him and he would find no court in the north willing to give him refuge so he came to the south brought by uh, dugadas rathor another famous personality from the times so he was given refuge here and this was a very valuable kind of guest that could be of use in the war against aurangzeb now on the western coast you had these abyssinian settlers they were mostly like pirates they were called the siddis but they had a number of ships and forts that could block it any trade or naval landings and then you had the portuguese both of whom were friendly with the moguls primarily because they depended on their trade and they needed to be friendly with the power so i think sambhaji raja spent the next couple of years trying to secure his coast to to avoid that when the mughal army arrives they could take refuge in the coast or use that for operations but it didn't work out and all of these forces combined and in the end we lost like two or three years to a stalemate so when the mughals finally marched south in i think 1683 or 84 like the mughal army was already in the south but aurangzeb arrived personally so then it led to two years of fairly severe fighting which neither side could actually complete the job so i think at that point aurangzeb changed his decision and decided to focus on the deccan sultanates instead so over two years from i think 85 to 87 he took bijapur and then i think in 89 he took 87 he took golconda now aurangzeb expected that with the fall of these maybe the marathas would surrender or just simply get crushed and what actually ended up happening is that many of many of the maratha sardars in their employ ended up going to join sambhaji raje so in a way they were actually stronger in 1687 88 than they were at the start of the war and i think it was unfortunate that he was captured and executed but his defiance to the end and his refusal to submit i think that really played a role in getting people to fight on for another 17 years perhaps it would not have happened if he would have submitted or you know made some kind of peace treaty where he would become a vassal true yeah. i think that became the that became the uh, inspiration and the rallying cry for uh, for the marathas after it, 1689 yeah so one of the like uh, funny things which we keep hearing is uh, that there are as we have already discussed there are plenty of small two medium ports in the region of pune and uh, this area so what used to happen whenever our uh, aurangzeb tried to get over any of the ports he tried bribing and then uh, uh, so that the fort would go over to his side but the 
moment the mughal garrison left they would switch or there would be some small uh, small raids and the forts were recaptured so this sort of thing went on or i think around for 10 years after the death of sambhaji to small to some extent and uh, also something we alluded to the seeds of the civil war were also sown like the rajaram and shahu uh, tarabai and shahu civil war were also sown when sambhaji himself got to power so there was some struggle for uh, legacy of shivaji raja as well but yeah we'll not go into it deep right now so yeah continue manish please right right pradamesh your comments on uh, marathas of the early 18th century and what was the political scene like when aurangzeb died before we move on so i think aurangzeb's death was kind of uh, perhaps one of the pivotal moments because his presence was the only thing holding the mughal army still in the deccan i think they had already recognized by 1705 or so that they were not going to win this war win in the sense of complete subjugation and the end of hostilities so i think they he, Yeah, Aurangzeb did not want the responsibility of, you know, that I failed in this war. So I think they had already begun their march north in Sip when he died. But another factor is that I think people seem to see the era from the 18th century as a kind of wild era where people randomly declared wars or they just, you know, invaded their neighbors because they wanted some land. And I think this is a very misleading way to see things. And it was very similar to what you would call a modern state era where treaties were respected and you know casus belli or cause for war was a very important factor in determining both war and peace so as an example when the moguls and the marathas made peace finally and signed a treaty in 1719 there was a big kind of cessation by the moguls that they granted the rights of chaut and sardashmukhi which is almost 35 40% of the revenue of the all the oral territories in the deccan to the marathas now what was the basis for this the basis for this is actually from shivaji raja's time because when shivaji raja you know established swarajya he raided and you know they like defeated the deccan sultans sufficiently that they offered to pay him both of these now their kingdoms were smaller and of course the amount was lower but this formed a basis for demanding it later that if you want to end the war we must go back to status quo and status quo meant you vacate all the forts that you occupied currently in the war and you must give us the same tribute that the former kingdoms used to give us now what had happened in the interim is that these kingdoms had become mughal provinces or subahs and their territory was actually much larger than it had been before the war but i mean it was a time of civil war in the mughal court and you know they wanted the marathas support so they ended up going and granting it and this this kind of uh, treaties actually left out mentioning their demands in malwa and gujarat because parts of these had also been occupied as early as 1703 while the war was still on because the marathas realized that they could not there is no point fighting an army of 200000 led by aurangzeb you can just invade and occupy other lands where they have depleted their soldiers so although the 1719 treaty made peace in in the deccan it didn't it did nothing to you know clarify what was the position of these disputed lands in malwa and gujarat and that's kind of the reason that bajira or others like the dabades and the powars could go on and invade and capture these regions right amit you mentioned a word peshwa uh, if you could tell us what does that word mean and what did that position end up uh, entailing and why was that position so influential when it came to marathas in the 18th century so uh, the word peshwa uh, the persian word means prime minister and it was a position that was uh, created uh, uh, earlier in the 17th century itself uh, uh, even during chhatrapati uh, chaja maharaj era and uh, as the name suggest it was one of the most important uh, ministers administrative position in the in the court of uh, court of the chatrapati or in any other king uh, 
And uh, I think the real transformation in the 18th century history uh, started when, as I said, when Bhaji Vishwanath was made, uh, made the Peshwa. Uh, I forgot the name of the earlier Peshwa that uh, Chhatrapati Shahu Maharaj uh, had. And uh, so the, the, the position became more important uh, initially because uh, the pivotal role that Bhaji Vishwanath played for uh, Chhatrapati Shahu Maharaj, as I was mentioning, uh, including, uh, uh, you know, uh, going to Delhi to settle the internal disputes between Mughals. And then as Prathamai said, then getting the revenue rights for uh, for the Deccan. And that obviously raised the uh, role uh, level of this role significantly, uh, both the, the importance, the status, the power. And uh, and again, something we'll come back to probably later. Uh, Bayaji Vishwanath uh, died in 1720. And in those days, again, today people will comment about it, but we can't use today's lens for analyzing a lot of these things uh, uh, of history. Many of these, uh, some of these positions at least were not automatically hereditary, but there was definitely a preference given for many of these positions. So uh, Chhatrapati Shahu Maharaj saw a lot of potential and talent in uh, the young Bajirao, and uh, uh, in spite of opposition, they were, uh, there was strong opposition in his court to uh, make someone else the Peshwa, saying Bajirao was too young. He decided to give him uh, a chance at a young age of 20, in 1720, when his father passed away. And he was obviously proven right, uh, right very quickly. So after, after 1720, after Bajirao, the role of the Peshwa became uh, more and more important as uh, the Maratha Empire started uh, started expanding. Uh, I'd like to add a quick comment to what Amit said. So, you know, when people were appointed to their positions, maybe held by their fathers, this is not actually unique to India. And this was the norm true, true. in most places. Because typically, these are, there were a lot of things depended on intrapersonal networks. So, when Balaji Viswanath was Peshwa, he would have met and made agreements with a number of people from other ports and so on. And his son would often accompany him on these trips. And this is true for everybody, all ministers, all kings, their princes and so on. And so there was a kind of thread of continuity where they may have secret clauses or you know trust that is established between these people would continue between their immediate successors but may not apply if you have a suddenly completely different family with completely different networks and loyalists coming into that role. And uh, the second is this, the importance of the treaty in 1719, because I think this was very kind of a landmark, because this was the first time that they had actually formally made peace, the Mughals and the Marathas, for a war that had lasted almost 30 years. And there, there is a debate among people that you know, it's like even Marathi historians have blamed Shahu Maharaj saying that he signed away his sovereignty. And I think that's a very big misinterpretation because the treaty does not say that the, the, the Maratha Chhatrapati is a Mughal vassal at all. It recognizes that Swarajya is a separate state that they are, that is not subject to the Mughal rule. And it also grants the rights to tax collection in Mughal lands. Now, there is no case where a vassal collects taxes from his overlord's lands. It's the other way around. You could say instead that half the Mughal empire was effectively vassalized, the, the, the southern half, and the northern half was like a separate state. And of course, it is natural that if you are ceding rights to tax collection and administration, then you, know, you have to kind of... Uh, defend it and keep order and maintain military presence. The, the second factor is that Shahu Raj's family, especially his mother, was still in Mughal captivity at this point. So if you read the, the language of the time, it's very flowery and it's very friendly. And I, I think it is understandable that he did not want to antagonize the Mughals while there was a chance at actually making a stable state with peace and securing his family's release. Right. So now it's 1719. There is now a peace treaty between Mughals and the Marathas. 1720 is when Bajirao becomes the Peshwa. Amit, uh, ha, ha, what happens next? How does Bajirao Peshwa go about expanding the scope and the influence of the Maratha Empire? 
I think uh, Bajira was uh, obviously a very capable and a very ambitious uh, leader. And uh, very early on, he made a uh, made a, a pitch to uh, Chhatrapati Shahu, uh, who was who was the leader. And there is that famous uh, famous quote uh, that he uh, made in the in the court of Chhatrapati Shahu. I forgot the exact line, but something like you know uh, the whole whole tree is about to fall and it's uh, it's it's uh, rotting. And if you just strike at the root, the entire entire tree will will fall. I mean, he was basically making a making a statement about the mughal empire saying it's it's hollowed out it's 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 weak it doesn't have good leadership and now's the time to uh, to get uh, to expand uh, and get uh, get more more control uh, of course uh, he had multiple uh, threats uh, uh, he was expanding in malwa that was his first uh, first uh, move up north uh, he had uh, he had uh, multiple enemies. Uh, the Nizam, which was uh, an offshoot of the old Mughal Empire, uh, but that time very much in present-day Maharashtra uh, near Aurangabad, uh, was was a big threat. Uh, you had the Portuguese on the coast. You had uh, the various uh, Mughal Mughal sardars, uh, or what was remaining of the uh, previous uh, empire in the in central India. And he had to fight uh, multiple adversaries, and uh, he fought. Uh, uh, one reason he's regarded as one of the uh, greatest 18th century uh, uh, generals or leaders is he fought multiple battles, didn't really lose a single major battle. He he expanded. He essentially took forward the legacy of uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj's uh, uh, warfare strategies of moving fast and and uh, uh, having a light cavalry and. Uh, uh, attacking, uh, doing surprise attacks and attacking the supply routes of uh, of the enemies, and that was one of the reasons why he was so successful in many many of his battles. Uh, but you can see that uh, he he was able to uh, expand uh, up north. Uh, his uh, one of his closest uh, aides was his uh, his uh, brother Chimaji Appa, and uh, one of the biggest campaigns that happened uh, during uh, the Bajira Vera was against the Portuguese, who at that time were a strong and a growing power uh, along the Kokan. And uh, few people today realize that it's not just Goa, but they controlled uh, a large part of uh, what is present-day suburban Mumbai, that is Bandra and up north, uh, or what was that time the island of Shashti or Salset, as uh, Portuguese called it. Uh, Vasai, large parts of Thane district, uh, Palgar, and uh, uh, present day Raigad districts. So Portuguese was, uh, they were a dominant power here. And uh, you can see the, uh, the 1738, 839 war that Chimaji Appa led against the Portuguese. Uh, he got a full surrender from them and got them to vacate their entire area. After that, the Portuguese were just restricted to, to Goa. So that was another uh, another big campaign. Uh, of course, there's, there's, there's a lot to discuss, but I think... Uh, uh, if I have to summarize, I think one, one, uh, and I forgot which historian uh, had mentioned this line I had heard a few years back, but I think it very aptly uh, captures uh, captures Bajirao's uh, reign. And uh, it basically says that, you know, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj uh, established the Swarajya uh, in the 17th century. And uh, it's a Marathi line, I'm translating it. Uh, so Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj established the Swarajya in uh, the 17th century. And Bajira uh, laid the foundations of uh, making it into a Samrajya, the so Samrajya being an empire. And that exactly is how uh, things changed in his 20 years. Right. Uh, Prathamesh, your comments on Bajira and his early reign and his reign. And also, if you could tell us about, uh, you mentioned Marathas were already there in Tamil Nadu, the Marathas of uh, other southern states. Right. So the Marathas were in Tamil Nadu in Bajirao's time, but it was kind of fairly recent in the sense that around, I think, Shahji Rajas, it was part of Shahji Rajas Jagir, like the northwestern parts of present day Tamil Nadu. And Shivaji's half brother, Ikoji, I think, he had declared his own coronation as king after Shivaji Raja coronated himself in 1672. So it, it remained an independent state, but it kind of did not rise to the level of power or prominence that the Swarajya of, you know, Pune or Satara did later. 
Uh, now, I, I think I'd, I'd rather comment on what the Maratha strategy was in the early 1700s. So when the war ended, even in 1719, you had a vast empire that occupies all of North India and about maybe 80% of the Deccan as a single power. And when the Nizamul Mulk or Asaf Jah, the first Nizam, came down to the south and made himself virtually independent, it gave a great opportunity to the Marathas because now instead of one power, you have two powers. So this would split their strength and now each would have a vested interest in making sure that you survive because otherwise it's a two-way unequal contest. So the Mughals in Delhi actually sent two armies to defeat the Nizam in 1720 and they failed. So they sent a third one in 1724. And at this time, both the Nizam and the Mughals in Delhi wanted the Maratha support. So this was a kind of major decision point for them. And Shah Maharaj sent support to the Nizam instead of Delhi. Now this made the Nizam secure. And this kind of, I would say, was very critical in splitting the Mughals' power in half. Because if you look at even revenue-wise, the Deccan was almost 50 or 60% of the total despite being territorially smaller. So the next big battle was 1728 between the Nizam and Bajirao, where the Nizam was defeated. Now, th th this battle is actually misunderstood. I think a lot of historians have written about this as uh, the Nizam got cut off, his supplies got cut off, and he was uh, you know, no, and forced to surrender. But there's actually an original letter of Bajirao in the Peshwa of Kar archives. And it says that we fought a pitched battle and the Nizam took 6,000 casualties. And that makes it a really major battle. We unfortunately don't have the details of it, but I mean, I think this is likely to have been more true because the Nizam immediately sued for peace afterwards. And this was a watershed moment because they got at the sword point what was promised to them in 1719. Now in 1719, they were promised almost half the revenue of the Deccan, but I mean, you can't really see half your empire without an actual trial of arms, which happened at Palkhel. And I think this also convinced the Nizam that he did not want to cross swords with them anytime soon. He gave them a free hand to expand the North. Now, as a state, if you have two enemies on two sides, then you must be at peace with one, or you always run the risk of being invaded into your back when you're invading on the other side. So I think the treaty at Palkade in 728 secured their south. The Nizam busied himself elsewhere. They did fight yet another battle in 1737, but I think by then they were already in possession of large parts of central India. Right. Uh Moving on, how do the how do the Marathas end up in Panipat in 1761? What was the size and the scope of their uh, empire? And there's this famous there's this famous uh, line that goes from Atok to Katak. The Marathas were there. How did they how did they end up there? And how did they end up in Panipat in 1761? Yeah, just one interjection, Manish. Uh, today happens to be the like around this time. Uh, Makar Sankranti happens to be the anniversary of Panipat, third, third Panipat, yeah. Right. Am I getting my date song? Was it 1761 or 1769? I think it was 1769. No, 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. 61. So where are Marathas? How do how do they end up in Panipat in 1761? And what was the scope of their expansion from 1730 to 1761? So 1728, Bajirao's brother Chimaji defeated the Subedar of what was the Malwa province, which is most large part of present day state of Madhya Pradesh. And by 1730s, they expanded almost to Gwalior, where you know Delhi was within a few days' march. So Although Bajirao raided Delhi, he did not, there was no kind of intention of conquest. And 1750s is when it really changed the balance of power between the Marathas and the Mughals. 
So one pivotal factor was that the Mughal Empire was kind of disintegrating into factions without a strong central leadership. And you had one faction, which was the Wazir in what the, the Awad state or Lucknow. And then you had the Rohilas who were Afghans and who were settled in Western India. And then you had the Durranis or you know, the actual Afghans in Afghanistan. So this whole contest began when the Afghans demanded uh, cessation of the territory of Punjab. And they're, they're, the Rohilas were their allies. So the Rohilas defeated then a combined army of the Wazir and you know, several other Mughal nobles in 1750. And the emperor panicked because this was very close to his, his personal lands in near Delhi. And then he got the Wazir to maybe friends with the Marathas in 1751. And they led a joint campaign. And so again, there's also a bit of a ethnic or religious angle here where the Wazir was Shia and a Persian, and he did not like these Afghan Sunnis. So there was internal fighting between the Mughal factions as well. And the Marathas were all too happy to expand their territory. They ended up cooperating with the Wazir. And there was a two year kind of campaign that greatly destroyed the power of the Rohilas in the North Gangetic, Gangetic Plains. Now, once again, the emperor called the Marathas for help. And by the time the Marathas arrived, the problem had already dissipated. They had signed away parts of the Punjab to Abdali. Now, you could not you know, summon this large army from a thousand kilometers away and then tell them to go back without giving them something in return. And so this kind of became a pattern that happened several times where the Mughals were asking Marathas for aid and then they would either renege on their promises or offer something else, not necessarily out of bad faith, but it was simply beyond the power of the emperor or whichever noble would make these offers. So what happened is by 1757, the Marathas had been signed away large portions of northern India. Agra was granted and this was again these are always territories that may not necessarily even be in the control of the Mughals they were just you know Mughal territory on paper so for example Agra was held by the Jat kingdom and it's it's more like a Mughals knew that they could not hold this territory anyway so might as well just hand them out and you know get uh, some stability so the pivotal point was Abdali's invasion in 1757 uh, once again, he was not supposed to be there and it was not the job of the Marathas to defend Delhi. I think you have some people complain that, you know, the Marathas did nothing when Abdali sacked Delhi in 57. And again, there was no treaty requiring them to do anything. It was, it, in fact, it was the job of the Rohilas led by the Najib Khan who was supposed to defend it. And he actually turned traitor, sided with Abdali, and that led to Abdali sacking Delhi, even carrying away Mughal princesses as slaves. So 1757 really kind of awakened a lot of people to the danger of this post. And then Raghunath Rao, who was in Rajasthan in some campaign against one of the states there, he was deputed to go and secure everything north that he could. You know, Maratas were granted everything that they could capture in the Punjab. So Raghunath Rao ended up leading a large army all the way to Atak. And I think he did not go to Atak personally, but there were Maratha Sardars who went all the way to Atak and Peshawar left garrisons there before returning. Now, they were handicapped in the sense that garrisoning something so far off, you know, note that Peshawar is something like 2,000 kilometers from Pune. And even something like few, I think a thousand kilometers from their base in North India. You cannot really keep your own men stationed in large numbers for so long. You have to rely on locals. And they ended up relying on one Abdus Samad Khan, who was one of uh, Abdali's nobles. And of course, he was not likely to be reliable, but they had to make do with what they had. So they left the garrison there and then they returned and it was a kind of three-way alliance between the Sikhs, uh, one former Mughal, uh, I think, governor named Adina Beg, and this uh, small garrison of Marathas, which amounted to maybe 10 or 15,000 spread out over the Punjab. 
Now, as long as these three would operate in a combined fashion, they were able to outnumber Abdali's numbers, which amounted to, I think, 25 or 30,000. But what happened is after Raghunath Rao returned to Pune, the Adina Beg died soon after, and the alliance with the Sikhs also dissipated because there was no common single personality that they could interact and negotiate with. So what happened is in 59, you had hostilities with the Nizam as well in the South. So that was kind of distracting away from something so far away in the North. So in the North, Abdali returned in 1759. And at the time, the preeminent Maratha Sardar in the North was Dattaji Shinde. He did have a sizable force, again, somewhere around close to what Abdali had, about 30,000. But the key problem was that the Rohilas could also field another 25 or 30,000 troops. So if the Rohilas and the Afghans combined, then they would greatly outnumber the Maratha forces. And that is exactly what ended up happening. Because the Taji Sinde uh, went north. He was deputed to either execute Najib for being a traitor, the Rohila. And instead, he was convinced that Najib acted you know, as, was, as he was forced to and he could actually be relied upon. So the Taji had three states he could either ally with or destroy, which were the Persian Suja in Awadh, the Rohilas in Western UP, and the Afghans in the West. So what he decided to do is build a bridge across the Yamuna, cross over into the Rohila lines, and in, just ally with them, march with their army together, and uh, destroy the Awadh state. Now, Najib knew that if the Awad state is destroyed, he would be next. And he, of course, did not really intend to cooperate with the Taji at all. He delayed him by several months and ended up fighting the Taji in two battles, which ended up in stalemates. At the same time, he sent these letters from the Taji to Shuja in Awad, and Shuja also marched with an army to aid him. So you had these three armies from Suja, from the Rohilas and the Afghans all converge on Delhi in 1760. And in one of these battles, the Tajish and they fell in battle. And now that really forced the Marathas to you know, pay attention to it because a lot was happening now and they were kind of caught unawares you know, for so long. So at this point, there was a discussion on the right course of action. And Raghunath Rao, who had led the earlier campaign, he demanded that he, I mean, he was experienced. He had been in three campaigns to the north. And he was blamed in the prior campaign in 1758 because he had run up a heavy debt and they could not you know, gain any net revenue from it immediately. So again, this is a little bit unfair because the land had been sacked by Abdali just a year prior. There could not have been any revenue from this land. But this led to a lot of uh, pickering in Pune on who should lead this campaign. And instead, it was given to Sadashiv Rao, who was Chimajapa's son. And I think that that's how they ended up going north. And then they got to Delhi because, again, they were reverse. Crossing rivers was a major factor in the monsoons because they would flood and sometimes leave you unable to cross for weeks or months. So they ended up deciding to take Delhi first, which they did in, I think, October or, sorry, not October, I think mid-year. And then the armies were camped on opposite sides without being able to do much. And Kunjpura, which was a major hub for the Afghan supply routes, it's, I think it lies about uh, 30 kilometers or so north of Delhi. No, so, Kunjpura is near Karnal. Kunjpura is near Karnal, which is about... Uh, which is about 120, 130 kilometers from Delhi. Okay, sorry. It, it's much farther, I guess. It's so, beyond Panipat. It's beyond Panipat as you go right, towards right. right. So I think Kunjpura was this major hub for the Afghans in securing their lines of communication as well as supplies. And so Sadashi Rao assumed that Abdali cannot cross. And thus he marched with his army and seized Kunjpura. This, this was a major blow to the Afghans because they had a sizable force there, almost 10 or 15,000, most of which were uh, destroyed. And I think that's the point where Abdali was able to somehow ford the river, cutting off the Marathas in their rear, and then we had the battle play out. Right. 
So what what is the aftermath of the battle? Amit, if you could tell us what happens after 1761, how do the Marathas pull themselves pull themselves back? Right. I think uh, Pratamesh has uh, summarized the the build up details uh, very well. Uh, I think it was uh, it was a matter of time where uh, the Marathas, the the dominant power in 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 India, in North India, and uh, the strongest uh, foreign adversary of that time, Abdali. The clash was bound to happen at some time. It would have happened earlier as well, and uh, because he had Abdali had multiple invasions uh, before. And uh, this major clash finally happened in 1761. Uh, uh, I mean, the previously something like this had happened was in uh, 1737 uh, or 8 when Nadir Shah had uh, invaded. And that time also there were plans uh, by Bajirao to move up north. So I think in, the, in, in, in a sense, this was a contest, contest for North India, contest for, uh, for the Delhi region. And uh, uh, while... Uh, Marathas, for multiple reasons, some of which uh, uh, Prathamesh discussed, uh, lost the battle at Panipat. In some sense, one of their objectives was uh, was achieved, which was to basically uh, repel the the foreign invader. Uh, Abdali never really uh, undertook a major invasion after that. He he went back to uh, Afghanistan, and then he had an internal uh, rebellion, and then he uh, uh, fell sick and he died uh, later as well. So, so in that sense, uh, this was the last invasion uh, of India from the Northwest. After this, obviously, as we all know, the invasions came from, from the sea. Uh, so, so even though uh, the Marathas lost, this objective was, was achieved. Uh, it was a huge loss for Marathas, uh, nearly 100,000 casualties, both uh, combatants and non-combatants. And uh, it, it, it sent shockwaves uh, through the entire, entire empire and especially here in Pune. Which was uh, which was the de facto capital of that time, and uh, and the shock got even worse when uh, about six months later, uh, Nana Sai Peshwa, who was already ailing at that time, uh, uh, died as well. So it was a twin shock uh, in in six months, where where the loss of Panipat, uh, the loss of Sudashiro Bhau, uh, and later on uh, Nana Sai Peshwa here in Pune, and. Uh, for many, uh, that could have been the demise of uh, the Maratha Empire. Uh, what happened later was was very interesting, and uh, this is uh, the topic of uh, the most recent book that Dr. Uday Kulkarni wrote, and which is something that I discussed last week uh, as well. Uh, and that is a young young Peshwa uh, Madhura who was just 16 at that time. Uh, Nana Sahib's second son, the eldest son Vishwasrao, also uh, died in uh, died at Panipat. Uh, he took over and in a short period of uh, 12 years amidst uh, numerous internal and external threats. Internal threats being there was opposition from uh, Raghunath Rao, his uncle, who was also uh, essentially uh, making a claim for uh, for power. And uh, all the Maratha adversaries obviously uh, looked at this as a great opportunity with the weakened Marathas uh, after the loss at Panipat, uh, whether it was Hyder Ali in the south, whether it was Dizam, uh, uh, many of the northern uh, uh, powers as well, and uh, in the middle of all this, to hold the and there were a lot of internal fighting, as I said. So, in the middle of all this, to hold the empire together, take care of the internal struggles, and uh, successfully confront uh, the adversaries was uh, was extremely important. And uh, this is almost a miracle of sorts that was achieved by uh, uh, Madhara Peshwa in the next uh, just 12 years. Unfortunately, he passed away at age 28 uh, uh, from tuberculosis. So from 16 to 28, he was able to achieve the uh, achieve the near impossible of uh, rebuilding. And uh, in, in less than 10 years after Panipat, uh, the Marathas uh, uh, led by uh, uh, Visaji uh, Krishna, uh, Ravchandra Ganesh and uh, uh, the Shindes and the Holkars uh, were able to uh, recapture uh, Delhi and uh, good parts of North India and assert their claim again in Delhi, uh, which they had lost uh, immediately after Panipat. So all this was uh, was achieved in a short period of uh, period of time. And uh, uh, again, so this covers the era till 1772 because a lot of things happened after Madhara's death, which uh, we can we can discuss separately. Uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, I mean, make one one uh, list, one popular quote written by uh, a British historian, 
the first British historian to write a detailed Maratha history, Randolph. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things that he wrote which may not be right, but this one particular quote is quite interesting. He says, the plains of Panipat were no more fatal to the Marathas than the loss of this uh, 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 excellent young prince. So he's basically saying the bigger loss for Marathas was not Panipat, but uh, mother of Peshwa dying at uh, a young age of 28 in 1772. Right. That's, that seems correct, right? The, the effect of Panipat uh, was not that long lasting. Uh, the was, was reversed was, was reversed in uh, to some good extent by Madhavrav and his, his team in the next ten to fifteen uh, years. Next, uh, right. Effectively. Right. Yeah. In a, in a more normal country, uh, I think you could have this whole these this whole era sort of presented as anti-colonial resistance leading to successful sort of comeback, one more invasion from the north, but even after that, there's a comeback, uh, but then unfortunately lost to the British. Uh, but it's interesting to me that that's not actually the dominant narrative in official India, right? Uh, there is a, uh, or is that what you would say an average Indian learns these days? No, we don't. Uh, like we've discussed in earlier episodes also, Omar the way history is taught is that post Mughals, there are British and then, uh, you know, so the British basically took the power from the Mughals. This aspect that there was almost a 100, 125 year period where Marathas were the dominant power of the subcontinent and the British really took India from the Marathas isn't really spoken about. Uh, but I guess that's a discussion for another day. Uh, Prathamesh, uh, your thoughts on post uh, uh, Marathas, post Panipat. And also, if we could talk about uh, how Marathas ended up setting up uh, states in Indore, Gwalior, the Holkars, the Sindhyas, the Gaikwads. So, post Panipat, uh, I think in 1761, just a few months later, it seemed like everything was collapsing because, you know, when an elephant falls, you know, everybody, all the jackals rush in for their bites. So, in, in the Northeast, like the, the regions of Bundelkhand and UP and Malwa, some of these were lost to Suja, who immediately seized because his army was intact. He had barely participated in the battle and he seized all those regions. The parts of the Doab, which is between the Yamuna and the Ganga in present day Uttar Pradesh, they were taken by the Rohilas and Punjab, of course, was taken by Abdali. But uh, I would note that this became a very kind of costly or pirate victory for Abdali because the entire campaign, he had to march with 30,000 troops for 1,000 kilometers and camp in a foreign land for almost a year. And many of his own troops were in pay areas. They refused to make fight any further. They had, there was nothing to plunder. They had already plundered the land dry, you know, two years earlier. So they had, they went through enormous hardship themselves. and. While the Marathas did take a lot of casualties, it, it's not like the Afghans got off lightly. So at Kunjpura alone, the casualties amounted to 10,000 or more. And I think they got off relatively lightly in the battle. The Rohilas took most of the casualties at Panipat. But even so, if you look at it as a comprehensive campaign lasting for two or three years, then the Afghans had taken a very heavy toll. And the Sikhs got quite strong after Panipat because it was a power vacuum at that point. And I think when he died in 1771, it was very ironic because the Marathas were back in Delhi. They brought this emperor from his British protection and they reinstated him. Again, it was all ceremonial at this point, but it was nevertheless important for legitimacy in the former Mughal lands, in, in the core lands of North India. So I think Abdali did not really gain much and the loss to Marathas was more in terms of interruption of uh, people. So around this time from 1750s, there was a kind of revolution in warfare where you could have large numbers of infantry with firepower that could defeat their larger numbers or equal numbers of cavalry. And this is something that had never happened in most of history because the Mughals were primarily a Central Asian kind of doctrine and they were originally heavy users of uh, 
cavalry based archers and this has already been obsolete by the time of 1700s when they switched to using muskets but it was still like cavalry still dominated the field and europeans had shown that they could field smaller armies but which were well trained and this was a kind this in europe this is called an infantry revolution that began in the 1600s and fully matured around this time so the nizam in the south was the first to adopt this in india he used the french to raise what they called the sepoys and the marathas quickly learned this and by 1750s they were also raising their own battalions and uniformed soldiers with drills and so on so i think sadashiv rao was one of the pioneers in the maratha state and his death led to an interruption of this which did not you know proceed at the same pace during peshwa madhav rao so i think that was a kind of setback in the sense that if this had been completed quite likely the conquest of rest of the subcontinent may have proceeded much sooner the second kind of difficulty was the rise of hyder ali in the south Uh, once again this was a case of a competent opportunistic uh, individual kind of going up exponentially in power because he started as an infantry man and within a span of a decade or less he had ended up being the de facto ruler of the state so hyder ali was a very tough opponent because he was he had uh, fought in the european uh, armies in 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 india and he knew how it was the new system of war and his army was a lot more professional and uh, you could say more firepower than any mughal army so i think madhavrao should get uh, substantial credit that he was able to defeat them not like once or twice but multiple times in a span of 10 years and they pushed to within almost i think a few hundred like maybe a few days march of sirangapatnam like the southern boundary of marathas had gone much further down than it was in balaji baji raj time right over sir what have you read what do they what do they teach in pakistan when it comes to history of marathas and uh, how was how are the marathas looked at uh, and their battles with abdali and hyder ali and everybody oh we we go well beyond anything you you are complaining about in indian sort of secular historians we go well beyond that uh, official history or textbooks uh, mostly gloss over they they are exactly what uh, prathamesh said uh, their view of the 18th century is that there is a great empire called the mughal empire and then there is disorder which is then solved by sort of being taken over by another empire called the british empire and uh, in the middle there was an entity called the marathas but pretty much the only reference we get to them is that they are supposed to be the backstabbers who were party to the destruction of tipu sultan and mysore which is of course partly true i mean they were uh, they were they were part of the uh, alliance against him at uh, various points and near the end right uh, but uh, that's that's about it that's all we hear about them is that they were somehow involved in being you know like everyone who is hindu in our histories generally tends to be like treacherous or bad in some way uh, so the maratha empire was a it's not even mentioned as an empire it's more like they were like the nizam of hyderabad and a minor player in the south is how most people would imagine them in pakistan if you ask them and a minor player who backstabbed tipu sultan that's pretty much it oh yeah oh, you know this is a very interesting point uh, that you know about backstabbing or personal interest and i think that there are two instructive examples here the the first being that in the north you had the the persian wazir who cooperated with the marathas who safdar jung and again this cuts across religions like religious lines because you know marathas were hindus and he was fighting against his fellow muslims who happened to be sunni and i think this religious factor is overrated because states primarily act in self interest and this is not always you know in line with religion or ethnicity even and in another the reverse example is in the south where during the anglo maratha wars in the 1770s hyder ali who the marathas had been fighting for almost two decades now ended up switching sides and joined the marathas against the english 
and you know this is once again kind of logical because the english were you know the stronger power at the time the marathas were in a civil war and so it made sense for hyder to make gains at you know the expense of the stronger power uh, you know in coordination with somebody who cannot pose a threat to him at this point and you know with regards to tipu i think there are some letters from uh, that are translated uh, actually all of the translations i've done are uh, posted online for free it's almost 300 pages of battles and diplomatic discussions i think somebody is interested they should uh, go and read all of those i'll i'll post a link uh, so you have discussion between mahaji shinde who was the almost like the supreme power in north india at the time with nana fadnavis who was in pune and they are discussing that tipu is a very valuable buffer state against the east india company and they do not actually want him gone because if he is gone then they would you know maybe partition this state between the east india and the marathas and now they would be neighbors and that's a bad thing to happen so the, the, the tipu came to power in i think 81 or 80 when hyder ali died and he it is actually tipu who broke the prior treaty in 1786 by in, you know invading the southern borders of the marathas and 87 they made peace because tipu thought that the english and the marathas would combine and launch a joint invasion which they did end up in 90 but then 1790 cooperation was very limited in the sense that the marathas only wanted to press their claims from the earlier treaties they did not actually want to end the mysore state or remove tipu specifically they wanted to punish but retain him as a power because they wanted a buffer state with the east india company right no i absolutely this is a good description of what actually happened but i was just talking about how it would be perceived or how people who are not much into history would know what they would know or what they might have heard right uh, pradeepesh if you could tell us about uh, marathas of central india the holkar sindhyas and uh, baikwads in gujarat right. so so primarily uh, at its lowest point in swarajya which is during maharani tarabai's reign what they had was they could not hand out lands because they did not control as many lands but what they could hand out is promises so they promised that if you conquer you know this territory then it will be assigned to you in perpetuity and this system kind of continued even after the state stabilized and of course it was end of an incentive to take risks and be bold because if you could not get you know if you won large battle and you could not gain from it then why would you really risk it so in in when bajirao was the peshwa he had these two loyal sagas the shinde and the holkar and they stayed i mean multiple generations of this family were as prominent as the peshwas themselves and they led all the they were present in almost every major battle in the century at in malwa in central india at panipat versus hyder ali and so on so they ended up establishing themselves as like mini states but they never declared you know any secession or so they were always they maintained themselves as sardars of the chhatrapati and i think this is again one of those uh, misunderstandings that people say that it was a confederacy or so and it was never a confederacy not till the end uh, every sardar including the peshwa called themselves up like the peshwa in fact though they never used the word peshwa they used the word panta pradhan which means the same thing so shahu maharaj was around till 1749 and at that till that point it, he i mean he did actively uh take all the important decisions uh, when he passed away he made an arrangement so that the chhatrapati would continue to be the head of state while the peshwa would be the de facto head of state uh, from the birth family which is the balaji baji rao and madhav rao and so on so in 17 i think 1798 or 97 you had civil war began in the marathas at multiple levels the shinde family had a succession crisis due to uh, mahaji shinde's passing and you had a similar situation in the holkar families and even in the gaikwads in gujarat and then 
the british took advantage of this of course when the civil war led to the peshwa baji rao to flee to the english in bombay and then after end of the war in 1805 i think at that point all these became separate kingdoms of sorts where i mean this the maratha state was still around the peshwa was still around but they became de facto you know separate from the authority because the peshwa had no authority left after 1805 beyond his core base in pune and 1818 formally marked the end of the peshwa the british got the chhatrapati to i mean they actually captured him in battle and they got him to issue a proclamation dismissing baji rao to as peshwa and formally recognized these states as independent kingdoms right uh, we've been mostly talking about the political history of marathas but pune is nothing if not you know one could argue the second most important cultural you know the cultural capital and the second most the second city of india when it comes to culture in a lot of ways uh, could you tell us about the cultural aspects of uh, marathas and how they <laughs> gorabs just message saying we would say first i'm sure uh, my good friends in calcutta have a difference of opinion <laughs> but coming back to the point uh, uh prathamesh could you tell us about the evolution of uh, culture and uh, what was the cultural scene like in the 18th century pune and in marathas in the kingdom of marathas i think amit would probably know better especially uh, about pune uh, i have not personally studied this in in a great detail to have a, like an informed opinion on it but from the scarce details that i have come across it, it seems a lot of books were read and uh, it is includes the bhagavad gita and uh, shiv puran and all of these there are records of uh, prices of these books in the letters so i i think a lot of it was there was continuity with what it, what we have today but yeah i mean i i don't think i know in more detail than that what are your thoughts on you know growing up in pune what, what is it about pune and what is it that what is the contribution of marathas in terms of building the cultural capital that yeah, so yeah so i i'll just add a brief point before giving, giving over to amit i mean who might be able to add a lot more so uh, to the people who are interested people who are interested in linguistics often uh, yeah often point out that the marathi language itself uh, is one of the more sanskritized uh, languages from the indo aryan language family from india so one of the reasons that is could be attributed to the policies of uh, chatrapati shivaji so uh, uh, a work called uh, raja vyakaran kosh was uh, was i wouldn't say published was uh, was uh, composed around the time of shivaji maharaj and a lot of uh, uh, words from sanskrit lot of new words were formed during that time to take over from the farsi uh, farsi words which were commonly used before that time so that uh, cannot be underrated i think so that remains one of the reasons why the marathi language which we speak today is how it is and it relies more, more heavily on sanskrit uh, grammar than other languages right then what we'll do is maybe over some we'll do another episode on the socio cultural impact of marathas and especially the prevalence of caste and caste system in the maratha society uh gorav you think prathamesh you think we should do a dedicated episode on that is there enough material uh, i don't know uh... i don't know uh, manish I, i don't know how much we can go into it so i had actually i, I had not uh, seen amit had left so maybe we can so i have not prepared uh, about the cultural aspects maybe we can cover that when we do the british episode but uh, i think we cannot go into much more detail with the end in point so we still have like episodes on uh, sikhs rajputs and uh, early like portuguese or uh, dutch influences in india to cover as well as right. we have not covered south india yeah. after vijayanagar so 
I don't know how mm-hmm. much mm-hmm. more in detail in Maratha we can go because as okay. <laughs> three of us are contributors from Maharashtra, we would keep on adding. But yeah, we have to stop somewhere. So maybe, uh, maybe in the next episode what? for British, we could cover a bit on the cultural aspect of Maratha. Right. We can certainly do that. And uh, just uh, we are sort of this has gone on long enough. I think we'll have to end soon. Uh, so we'll ask Pratimesh one last question about the administrative structure of the Maratha state, right? So there is obviously a, a, a state that is able to collect taxes, uh, provide justice. Uh, w- w- but what are the mechanisms they were using? Or what do we know about that? Uh, or at least some sort of a brief picture of what the administrative structure looked like. So I think you can divide the Maratha state into several eras. The first being in Shivaji Raja's time. The second is uh, the long war from 1680s to like early 1720s. And the third is when the state re-established itself. So from in the first uh, era from 16, like 60s to 1680s, you had a very kind of high complexity state where you had ministers, appointed with specified duties. They were paid cash salaries. They were not paid typically as was the custom in most feudal states. They were not paid in land grants. They would be actually paid fixed salaries or bonuses like you have in a modern state. And this has its own advantages and disadvantages. Advantages in the sense of efficiency because you kind of reduce corruption when you do not make people loyal to their immediate overlord in some distant province. Instead, everybody has to depend on the king and his bureaucrats. And I think it was a fairly efficient state that was able to generate a lot more revenue than its peers, given its small land and still raise a very professional fighting force that could defeat equal numbers of uh, more well-equipped enemies. From then, then I think the long war had a period when all of this really broke down and he kind of reverted to a feudal state. A lot of nobles would be de facto little kings in their neighborhood. They would be granted all the powers, again, as a motivation because that's where their motivation to expand and conquer territory. So that's an, again an era when, again, you do not have much documentation from the time because not much survived and it was really decentralized. From 1720s or more generally 30s, you have a a very stable state return to Maharashtra. And I think now we have a lot of documents to really comment on how it worked. So for instance, the the basis for territory was holding forts and cities. So a fort would have maybe a a Kiledar who would be the commander of the fort. And typically there would be three different people of either different castes or ethnicities or backgrounds so that no no one person could betray and surrender the fort. And you would have a very stable tax collection system where, you know, similar to the Mughals, I think in many cases it was retained when the province was conquered. You would have uh, Kamvizdar, who was the tax collector of the region, a very similar role to what a British collector would do later. And this was a time when maybe 80% or so of the population, perhaps even more, was involved in agriculture. So collecting agricultural taxes and distributing it was the chief occupation for most people. So the Kamvizdar would you know, be involved himself in all such activities. They would measure the land, they would assess the productivity of the land classified based on rainfall. So they would have an estimated yield on how much tax this is going to produce. And either the money lender or the Kamvizdar could kind of give a lump sum or prepay this tax to the government and he would even get interest on it. So the central government's cash flow is kind of better managed. They don't have to wait until the crop is harvested and sold. And for the judiciary, I think you had the same village panchayat system everywhere where local disputes would be handled within that would not uh, escalate. And the most high profile case actually is the famous one where Raghunath Rao was pronounced guilty of murdering his nephew. So I think we, and there are actually a lot of records in for judicial cases and administrative ones. The, the, it's called the Selected Diaries of the Peshwas. Uh, I can provide a link. It's translated to English as well. So we get an idea of 
uh, how judicial systems worked and how cases were tried or revenue was like you find people complaining that there was no rainfall in this province so i want a tax exemption or somebody's uh, animals got stolen and so on and you would have a very organized state they would pay compensation in case you, you know bandits raided your village or some army marched through and it damaged your crops a lot of features that would be common with other states later right gorab you have a question one one short question for but while we are on it uh, you know there is a lot of british propaganda was about the marathas being sort of predatory raiders all over india and uh, of course the highlight of that is the uh, pindari's raid into bengal uh, and where they did uh, plunder and raid right so uh, what is the what is the actual position uh, on this issue how much were they plundering and raiding and how much were they just running a regular empire so i think this is really uh, blown out of proportion in terms of what actually happened and the amount of attention it gets so typically pindaris have always been around in many parts of india i think i read a portion in jangir nama recently where he complains that uh, malikambar and some of his pindaris were raiding mughal lands and you know, they sent some troops to chase them out but they were defeated so pindaris were essentially large groups of local bandits or just freebooters who job was primarily not combat but to raid supply lines now note that destroying property was typically not something they indulged in just in the sense they would maybe burn crops to prevent the enemy from getting it but destruction of private property like in cities or so on they they would simply not bother with it because it was too risky and the traditional role was to harass supply lines or you know capture any undefended treasures like money meant for paying soldiers in the camp or in the convoys now in case of bengal uh, i think there there were bargies i or like i think they are also called bargies and pindari so their numbers were something around 3000 maybe or 4000 now if you read the what i would call serious propaganda they claim things like half a million deaths from pindaris and i have absolutely no idea how 4000 lightly armed people with maybe a sword or a spear are able to kill half a million people uh, i i mean i would believe if they said that over the three invasions maybe uh, a few thousand people died or wounded i mean that's completely possible and maybe they torched some villages and destroyed some and sacked some more yes that is believable and it, it's just a part of war at the time uh not all sardars use pindaris you do not see mentions of pindaris much i in fact i've never come across any in, in bajirao's army or madhavrao's army much i think madhavrao used them once against hyder ali but typically you would see these in far off regions in in central india or eastern india and i think the the other infamous time of using pindaris was in the civil war at the end and at this point they were bring, they were brought in from all corners of india to shore up numbers so in in 1802 you have people complaining about yashwantra holkar's pindari even plundering the suburbs of pune and I, I, again i think at this point it's just civil war and there is no administration left it's it's a time for free for all so yes uh, they were bad no question of it and it just that the scale of it is simply blown out of proportion and at, at no point have i come across uh, a mention of more than maybe 2 or 3000 pindaris and there is really a strong upper bound to how much damage such a small number of people with no fire power or artillery can actually do yeah so uh, maybe just a couple of points to add so we touched upon shivaji raja and how he remains one of the i would not to use any like almost a godly figure in maharashtra so more revered uh, i would say than uh, shri ram or shri krishna so that it's obviously the legacy of uh, him today uh, another thing uh, which is commonly known so a lot of accounts of the early maratha period especially during the times of shivaji raje are uh, commonly the hagiographies are very common so uh, 
the impact of that is very high. Uh, one thing which we would like to, uh, I would like to add is the kingship of the Marathas. It was not divine kingship per se. So uh, one thing which often comes up again and again uh, is uh, saying that Rajya Rayatecha hai. So that means the rule belongs to the, like the state belongs to the people, that sort of thing. So if you want to look at it that way, you could look at the uh, Swarajya of Shivaji as sort of beginnings of democratization in one aspect. Uh, he also uh, did a lot of reforms. So I, uh, we are out of time, maybe Prathamesh or maybe we can add about, about that later. But a lot of land reforms and those things also took place uh, during the early Maratha time. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, maybe add just here that all of the major rulers Maratha had Apart from maybe to certain extent Shivaji Maharaj himself, everyone died young. So Sambhaji died in his 20s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Peshwa Bajirao died at the age of 39. Uh, Nana Sai Peshwa died at the age of 41. Madhavarao Peshwa died at the age of 28. I think Shivaji Maharaj died at the age of 49 or 50. But that is like at the higher bound. So one cause of uh, Marathas not being able to achieve as much as they promised could be the uh, life expectancy of the major rulers. So that is something we can uh, maybe speculate about. So just one thing before ending, uh, Prathamesh, what about the uh, Maratha accounts? So uh, I have read Dr. Kulkarni's book. So it comes up again and again that the Peshwas especially were always striving for cash so so despite being one of the most uh, dominant power in, in the country why was peshwa bajirao always under debt and that happened to continue right till the end so one of the reasons pindaris came up is they don't have to be paid from the treasury right they are uh, free to plunder and uh, see for themselves so that is how the um, number of pindaris apparently rose because the state was unable to fund large armies. So just maybe touch upon the Maratha economics or exchequer. So, so I think this is, uh, there are two issues here. The first is that even if you have the money, the issue is logistics. So if your campaign is in Delhi and your money is in Pune, you don't really have the money. So you, would, you still have to borrow money from a money lender because you need to spend the money at the destination. You know, you don't have uh, digital payments at the time. So you you need the gold actually with you while you are in maybe Bundelkhand or in Eastern India or in Delhi. So credit was a part of all warfare. It, it's common across the world. And the shortage of funds was, again, very standard across the world. There is nothing unique about it. Whenever you launch any you know, large-scale invasion or distant provinces, this is always going to happen. You would read about this even in the British campaign against Tipu in 1790, when they were almost out of supplies, they were almost out of money, when the Maratha you know, arrived with their own food and gold. So this is a part of military campaigns. Uh, this was especially true for Marathas because their army was primarily cavalry. And this is more exp much more expensive to maintain than infantry. Typically, it costs you almost somewhere between three times or you know, maybe if you add extra costs of artillery, then perhaps three and a half, four times. So if you fielded maybe 15,000 cavalry at a distance of 500 or 1,000 kilometers away, that's, that's a substantial cost. And traditionally, they would recoup this cost by either winning in battle or you know, imposing the cost on the defeated party. Now, typically, that I think there even is complaining about the raids in Rajasthan, for example, by the Pindaris or troops. And in in all these cases, you know, you had a set of troops who were promised spoils either by one side or the other as the as the reward for participating in their own internal civil wars or so on. And then either due to inability to pay or just you know, breaking of agreements, they would not be paid. And so you need to get that money from somewhere. So I think the Maratha state's finances weren't actually as bad as uh, you would seem from the letters. I think we need more study on actual hard numbers, 
that there are supposed to be balance sheets that are yet to be translated i think that would give us a more clear picture of what the debt was actually like okay okay my impression was mostly reading about from bajirao's personal letter so he had a lot of burden of debt and he was troubled by it so i have not done that much of uh, in depth reading so that was my primary thought and another thing which comes up is uh, while the marathas in maharashtra we were not building that grand monuments as they as the uh, uh, states in northern india were so that is also one thing yeah but maybe we are uh, out of time which, which are the monuments from 1700s in northern india uh some of the i am not sure so they they oh. we do have some here in delhi there is safdarjung stone and uh, from the 17th century you are saying is it oh sorry i mean 18th 18th, 18th 18th century 18th century so yeah we still have some but you are right because the political unity is not there in north india and mughal empire sort of collapsed there isn't enough money so we but yeah we don't have the kind of stuff the mughals came up with so you would need a long, long stretch of peace to actually get nice things like taj mahal or no, no, that. we are not talking like as large things as taj mahal but even the palaces you see in uh, uh, madhya pradesh or gujarat or rajasthan are much larger and grander than anything you see in maharashtra so uh, one of my friends actually who is uh, a cultural uh, who does cultural tourism he attributed that to some of the uh, personal choices or that uh those kind of things but we do not have any like 100 150 years uh, of rule and we do not have any grand uh palaces or that sort of thing so palaces did not actually exist before the 1800s like even in in europe it started a little earlier like versailles and all of those but by and large all those nice buildings even in paris that you would see are all in the middle of 1800s now in in north india if you look at the states that survived like in rajputana for example if you go to jaipur typically the palaces are within the forts so you had you would have the same situation here you would have had a nice uh, like a throne room and diwani khas etc even in the forts in raigarh also just that they are destroyed after all the war so you don't actually see anything survive but you do actually see palaces in maratha states like gwalior and indore and in in the in gujarat and these are fairly grand palaces at par with what you would see in europe for example like there's a, a palace in gwalior i forgot i think it's called jay vilas palace of the shinde and it has similar grand throne rooms and you know massive chandeliers and ballrooms and pianos and fancy artifacts from all over the world all of that so they are late 19th century yes they are, i think they are mid or later 19th century again like if you would need a century of or at least a few decades of peace and wealth accumulation to actually be able to do it right yeah perhaps what we'll do is we'll do another episode on uh, the socio cultural history of marathas and marathas of the 19th century some other time Omar sahab any closing comments before we ask pratmesh and gorav to sort of make any closing remarks i uh, know thank you i was mostly a listener in this and i really enjoyed it uh, and i think we will have pratmesh and uh, amit both uh, again in various episodes for all sorts of reasons we should do you know things in much more detail also but in separate not as part of this series certainly we'll do that uh gorav uh, your final comments before we ask prathamesh to wrap it up yeah so we on the legacy con- of marathas and how we see them today and how it shaped modern india whatever so yeah i am talking in the like the accent the term everything which i owe to like m- my entire identity goes back to the maratha state and whatever followed after that the british time so i could say same about prathamesh or others as well so the legacy is us i would say you don't have to look at it in any other way so we are the legacy of the empire right right yeah, I, Paramesh, I final words on that uh, i think the maratha state would be uh, i would call a fairly successful one there, there is no state that lasts forever and every state that 
tries to avoid the fate of its predecessor ends up ending in some other way. So I don't think we should see that, oh, it's bad that they collapsed. You know, every state was going to go the Mughals, the Persians, Romans, all of them. But the Marathas did prove that it is possible, it is fairly within their capacity to build a high complexity state, one that can match Europe, either you know, European armies of its time. It was a great military power. It was a reformist power. It was fairly meritocratic for its time. And it still kept touch with its roots. So I, I think a lot of thoughts today that Maharashtrians especially bring with them is a result of the legacy of this state. So in a, in a sense, the state may have gone, but like the nation kind of still survives the identity. Yeah. And uh, just one thing, like uh, just to end on that, so Shashi Tharoor, who has been going on his own history work, sort of. So he also sort of uh, made that point that without the British intervention, the Maratha state, which was the predominant state at that time, would have uh, metamorphosized into a modern nation state. And uh, we would have had all the benefits of modernity without the British intervention. I don't know how much we can defend that or like what is the state. But yeah, even Shashi Tharoor has made that point so yeah That's it. right right with that we'll end this episode thank you thank you everybody thank you thank you everyone for having me here tune in next week for brown cat